what God did, he separated them. He, he put them here. You stay here and you stay here and you go here and you go here. He intentionally separated them. You know you're in process when God begins to sovereignly and providentially separate you from some stuff. his name we give God glory and praise amen I tell you he's an amazing God isn't he and we give him all the praise and glory I tell you we thank God thank this awesome choir y'all are so awesome we all need to be filled up would you help me thank God for the set man of God of this house once again your pastor what a gift come on what a real gift pastor Howard John Wesley man wow you may be seated. I am just blown away by his, his humility. I'm blown away by his, his spirit of excellence, his work ethic. And many are called, but few are chosen. Make no mistake about it. Alfred Street, you've got one of the chosen ones. Yes, you do. Honor him. Nine years. My God, honor that. We thank God. Nine is the number of birth. And so I don't know what you're pregnant with, but I know it's coming. I thank God for it. And we give God the glory. We thank God for all of you once again. It's a delight and joy to be with you tonight. Thank all of you who are here tonight. Of course, we again are grateful for those that are with us and our team. Of course, I've got some guests who are with me tonight. I want to thank God for them. Uh, we certainly thank God. A powerful woman of God, Zena Pierre, is with me tonight and a whole row of folks uh I, I just thank god for for all of them nicole francis and uh cedric bobo i just want them to just wave but that's some folks that are on that road right there i just appreciate them and all yes thank you all of all of um the Mount Zion folks who are here tonight, thank God, just wave at me. I thank God for you. Look at there. Yeah, I saw tweets. One, one young lady says she canceled her date to be here tonight. I said, Lord, have mercy. I'm so honored about that, and we praise God. I hope you again stay connected to us uh, on um, social media. I love, I've been talking to some of you already, and of course, it's at Joseph Walker 3. It's just that simple uh, on Instagram, Twitter, and Periscope. I had a whole Periscope last night talking about how awesome Alfred Street Church is. And I'm telling y'all got it going on. I'm telling you, and uh, I ain't no joke about that. So we thank God, even those who are streaming. Thank you so much. Let's get into the word of the Lord. Who came to be blessed tonight? Um, let's go over Deuteronomy chapter 32 tonight. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Father, thank you for this word tonight. I pray you will speak to us. Our lives will be blessed. We thank you for your anointing that does all the work. We just get out of the way and say, have your way. We pray that lives are transformed. Push us to another dimension, another level tonight. And we give your name the glory and praise that it's already done. In Jesus' name, amen. Look, if you will, around Deuteronomy chapter 32. Actually, I want to really start around, if I may again, start around verse 3. If I can start at verse 3, I'm sorry. Let's start there for a moment. I want to read it, and um, it says this, For I proclaim the name of the Lord and ascribe greatness unto our, unto our God. I will publish the name of the Lord and ascribe greatness to our God. Uh, the next verse says this, going to verse uh, number 12. The Bible says, uh, He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment, God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. Um, the Bible says that uh, they have corrupted uh, themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are perverse and they are a crooked generation. Do you thus require of a quite the Lord, O foolish people, and who are unwise? Uh, is not uh, he the father that hath brought thee? Hath he not made thee? Has he not established you? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask your fathers, and they will show you. The elders, and they will tell you. Uh, when the Most High divided the nations, their inheritance, and when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. 
For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land, in a wasteland, in a howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him and kept him as the apple of his eye. And as an eagle stirs up its nest and flutters over her young, spreads about her wings, taking them, uh, bearing them on her wings. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. You may be seated today in the presence of the Lord today, and I want to talk tonight about don't fight the process. Look at somebody, just tell them, don't fight the process. There is something within all of us that likes to be in control. If we were honest, all of us have a sense of personal autonomy where we like to navigate circumstances and affairs of our lives without God's permission. As a part of us that has a little control freak, right? We all like to be on the God squad. We want to tell God how we think our situations ought to work out. But God is so amazing that every now and then he'll take you through a series of experiences just to let you know that he doesn't need your opinion. He doesn't need your input, that he knows exactly what he's doing. God, when he moves, he already has a strategy, he always has the end game in mind. And though you may offer God suggestions, please understand that God's ways are perfect. His plans are already established in the heavens. And what is important to understand, people of God, is that how God works is through process. And God brings us to places of destiny. You must understand it is not a, uh, a sprint. It is a marathon. It is, not, it is something that takes steps. It is a process. And all of us resist process. There is something within us that likes instant gratification. Uh, we've got instant coffee, instant grits, instant tea, instant marriage, instant everything. We... We want it right away, but, but you must understand that uh, people of God, God works in process. He, he, that's why many people uh, in this generation are in trouble because they love taking the elevator versus the stairs. Uh, because the way God works is one step here and you learn and one step there and you learn and all of these steps are a part of your development until God prepares you for where he is taking you. He will not release you into something until you have been properly prepared. And so our natural proclivity is to resist it. Our flesh hates process. As a matter of fact, you might recall Jesus who suffered as a man in the garden of Gethsemane. Remember when he was in that place, Jesus, the man who was suffering, said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup, let this process pass from me. But he was God enough to step in and say, but not my will, but thy will be done. Process, people of God, is where you learn things about God that you otherwise would never know. Process is where you learn things about people around you you never would know. Process is where you learn things about yourself. It's an amazing thing to go through process. And you must understand something, people of God, because on the other side of process is where God elevates us. He takes us to new dimensions. And so today, I want to really talk to somebody today and let you understand that everything inside of you may be resisting the process, but God's word to you today is don't fight it. Uh, don't resist it because God is about to take you into something that's going to literally blow your mind. But every tear you cried, every experience you had will not be wasted. And God's going to use it all because all things still work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. There are some people sitting around you. I'll show you who they are just in a minute. Watch that. There are some people who, who literally look over their lives right now and thank God for everything they've had to go through. Uh, because if they had not gone through it, they wouldn't be as strong as they are, as wise as they are. They're giving God glory for stuff you are still complaining about. They say, Lord, thank you for every fake friend because now I know who my real friends are. Thank you for everybody that left because it made room for all the new folks you were trying to send in my life. Thank you for every mountain, every valley, every storm you brought me through. If I never had a problem, I wouldn't know what faith in your word could do. But through it all, I've learned how to lean and depend on you. 
For Israel, this is a very interesting place when in Deuteronomy, when, when this song comes out, it is a song actually in Deuteronomy 32. Israel were known by oral tradition, they were known by many songs that they would sing. And, and this song here is very interesting because there were two things in the life of the children of Israel as they were here now, desert babies. They were pilgriming, and they were headed somewhere, but they were in an interesting spot. And there were two things they had to remember while they were in process. The first thing they had to be keenly aware of is, is who God is. Uh, they had to be clear now because remember what they had known about God was based on second and third hand information. What they had known about God was based on oral tradition, what someone had told them. But now they're moving into another space now where God would be real to them individually and corporately based on the experiences that God had given to them. There is that moment when you heard that God was a healer. But then there's that moment when you graduate where you know for yourself. There was a moment you heard God was a way maker but then when your back was up against the wall you found out that God was a way maker. You don't need nobody else to tell you what you know for yourself. Some of you are still depending upon proselytization and catechism and you're depending upon what somebody's teaching you in some classroom about God but there are others of us that have been the hell and back. We've been dragged through the mud and we found out that there's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. Somebody shout, I know him for myself. But then, but then there was a second thing that Israel had to remember, not only who God was, but they had to be keenly aware of who they were. Their identity was going to be important now. They could not live by vicariously to anybody else. They had to know who they were. Their corporate identity, their individual identity, like many of you, you've got to be clear about who you are. You've got to be comfortable in your own skin. You've got to be confident in how God made you, how God wired you. Uh, God knew exactly who you were when he made you. He made you just like he wanted you to be. God God made your head like he wanted your head. He made your hips like he wanted your hips. He made your lips like he wanted your lips. You ain't got to augment it. You ain't got to change it. If people don't like you, say you go your way. I'm going my way. And may the Lord watch between us while we're absent from one another. I'm cool in how God made me. I know who I am. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I am the head and not the tail. I know who I am. And when you know who you are and you know whose you are, there is nothing you go through that God can't get you through. And so the process for many of you right now, you're trying to navigate through this ambiguous space called process. You know you're on your way to something, right? You're on your way to this marvelous destiny, this marvelous vision you're trying to get to come to pass. But God has got you in this place called process. Let's see if we can understand and unpack this and figure out what God is trying to show us while we're on our way to it. Here it is. I think it's important to understand, first of all, people of God, uh, the righteousness of God. Because, see, first of all, uh, you got to understand that God, his ways are right. Now, this is a very interesting interesting thing that's being spoken in the text. His ways are righteous. His ways are right. The righteousness of God suggests that uh, God's ways are right regardless of how your situation may turn out. That God's righteousness is not hinged upon you affirming his righteousness, but God is in inherently righteous. As a matter of fact, there were some things that God did. They felt like God was going left in your life, but then when you look back over your life, you thank God for it because his ways were right. Here it is. Come here. Let me talk to you. There were some people that you were holding on to and you had to be with them couldn't live without them uh, but then God said that ain't right for you you kicked and screamed but then uh, two years later you saw them in the mall with somebody else and you said Lord thank you because if I knew then what I know now oh somebody shout he's a righteous God he sees in the future his ways are right it may not feel right to you while it's happening but you got to remember that God is a righteous God but not only that but right Righteousness has a cousin. The cousin of righteousness is sovereignty. Now, the sovereignty of God suggests that God can do whatever God wants to do, how God wants to do it, to whom God wants to do it. And God owes nobody an explanation as to why he does what he does. That God acts and he is under no rule other than himself. And so the sovereignty of God, once it is imposed upon your life, you must be willing to accept the blessing and the burden no matter how it comes. There are many people that look at you and wonder why God is blessing you, why God chose you. You. All you got to say is, hey, God is sovereign. God will skip over people just to bless somebody else. I can't get mad if God is blessing my neighbor. At least God's in the neighborhood. I'm trying to help somebody here today. God is sovereign. 
and whatever God does it's always right he always has a plan for it and so God is righteous God is sovereign but here it is God is a great God somebody shout he's a great God I will ascribe greatness unto our God. Are you telling me tonight that I'm supposed to say, Pastor, that God is a great God, but I got all of these challenges going on in my life? Are you telling me in the process that I've got more month than I do money? You telling me I'm supposed to just throw my hands up and just say God is a great God? Are you trying to tell me with all the stuff I got going on in my job and in my house, I'm just supposed to say God is a great God? Oh, yeah, he's a great God. As a matter of fact, have you checked the record? When you look carefully at how good and how great God is, you might find some interesting revelations. When you look at this text, how it begins to open up, how the word of God was going to come down like the dew upon the grass, how the word of God, this whole metaphorical language about nature points us unto the greatness of God, that God is so great. All you got to look out and look at nature, the heavens declare his glory. He's a great God. God is so great. God did not submit or he did not look for your opinion when he created the world. When God put the sun to work the day shift, the moon to work the night shift, God scattered the stars on the backdrop of the universe. God put wall to wall carpet on the earth and called it grass. And when God got through creating the world, he didn't wait on you to give an applause. God congratulated himself and said that was good. Somebody shout he's a great God. If you think that's something, then look at God's finest creation. Look at how God made you. Nobody else has your DNA. Nobody else has your fingerprint. Nobody else has the dreams you have, the visions you have. When God made you, he threw away the mold. I wish the people around you knew how you just upgraded the pew when you sat next to them. I need you to look at somebody and say, God is a great God. As a matter of fact, for every doubter in this place, help me preach this word. Look at your neighbor say if you knew me about five years ago and you looking at me right now tell them that's enough evidence to tell you he is a great God searched all over couldn't find nobody nobody greater he's a great God listen God is God is God is God is righteous God is sovereign God is great but then God is my rock. <laughs> he is my rock. He is my place of stability. The reason why many of you are so flighty because you have no stability because wherever there is no stability, there is often gullibility and vulnerability. But here in process, you must understand that God is my rock. He is my solid foundation because there will be things in the process that will attempt to uproot you from where God wants you to be. But see, God does not put blessings in the hands of people he puts them in the hands of people who are in proper spaces I want to bless you I want to bless you uh, you know we've got a little football team in Nashville called the Titans we do you know and we got a little football team called the Titans they got a play right they got a certain play I know this play very well you know it because I'm sure the Redskins I'm sure the Ravens I'm sure they all have this play you know they go in the huddle and they call the play watch this and when they go in the huddle and call the play what happens is the receiver has to go down the field 15 yards cut across for about five yards the quarterback is already back he has released the ball the ball is in the air now the receiver has a defensive back who is allowed a hit that hit is a legal hit and that hit is designed to throw him off his route I'm going somewhere whenever God is about to do something in your life you better get ready because the enemy is going to give you that first hit he's trying to throw you off your route but touch your neighbor say I'm still running my route tonight here it is and wow there was if he's a good receiver he's gonna keep running his route wait a minute the ball is already in the air because the quarterback is not throwing the ball to a person he's throwing it to a spot and if that receiver gets to that spot what's in the air will meet him in that spot I'm trying to tell somebody God has already released your blessing all you gotta do is get to your spot need somebody to shout tonight and say I'm in my spot tonight man you don't have to like me you don't have to speak to me but I'm in my spot tonight I don't have to get invited to the party I don't have to be over your house I'm in my spot tonight and I'm going to be steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord for my labor is not in vain God is my right
tell somebody I ain't going nowhere till I get where God has for my life. God is, God is righteous. God is sovereign. God is my, he's great. He's my rock. God is my salvation. We're just talking. Uh, they have corrupted themselves. They are not his children. You're going to act like that. You're going to walk around. The song is about you, you, you need to understand in process while you're on your way to the place, the destiny, the vision, the manifestation of all that God's going to do. Please understand you are not all that. There's something wrong with all of us. And for those of you who are perfect, please, when you find the perfect church, don't join it because you're going to mess it up. God has no perfect churches because he has no perfect people. You're going to act like that God is a God of salvation. You have corrupted yourself. You, you have to understand the salvation of God. It is God who, who has saved you, who has given you the privilege to do what you're going to do. Remember where God found you. See, many of us have convenient amnesia. We get saved and we wear, you know, have our clergy collars on, but your clergy collar is nothing but a fallen halo. We, we walk around like we've never done anything, like we, we act shocked, like, you know, when somebody, because what we've done, uh, Pastor, we've created this hierarchical construct of sin. If we make sin hierarchical, then we can then soften the blow of our transgressions and we can look down our glasses in judgment on somebody else. You know, we have a hierarchical construct of sin, you know. <laughs> you know I'm not a, I don't smoke crack, I just smoke weed. <laughs> not a homosexual, I'm just a whoremonger. <laughs> Well, somebody say sin is sin it doesn't matter what you done. you ought to just give God glory that if it had not been for the grace of God none of us would be here today somebody ought to just thank God that he looked beyond your faults and he supplied your need we ought to just thank God that he saved us my life is sweet my joy complete I'm saved when I understand that God is God is, wait, God, when I understand, when I'm clear on this, that God is, God is righteous, God is sovereign, God is great, God is my rock, God is my salvation. Then, in the process, I, I just come tonight on this second night of this revival to just make two announcements, and I'm done. Two announcements. <laughs> the first announcement I want to make tonight uh, is, 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 is that God is about to restore you in your desert situation. I need you to tell somebody restoration's coming to your house. Uh, uh, oh God. Uh, pe people of God, I, I, I want you to get this. This is, this is, this is, this is, this is important. The Bible, the Bible says, listen, when, when God moves, you have to accept the fact that God navigates our lives through a series of experiences. He says, now understand, if you want to know how to get through this process, Israel, ask your fathers they'll tell you ask the elders they will show you how the most high god dealt with them israel were generational they everything they did was generational so if you want to know how to get through this process ask somebody who went before you everybody's chasing destiny but nobody wants their history <laughs> That's some wisdom in your history that is a launching pad for your destiny. He said, look at what God did, how God divided the nations. He divided their inheritances. He, he, he separated the sons of Adam. This is what God does. Watch how the restoration process takes place while you're in this desert situation. See, it's separation first because what God did, he separated them. He, he put them here. You stay here and you stay here and you go here and you go here. He intentionally separated them. You know you're in process when God begins to sovereignly and providentially separate you from some stuff. Some of you, 
some of you, you know, we come into human relationships. It, it, is, it is our natural tendency. To, we come into human relationships based upon uh, people having it going on right now. We, we want to connect with people because they're hot right now. We run down people. Can I get your card? Can I take a selfie? We, we run down people because we, we want the people that's hot right now. But, but, but what God is going to do in your life, he's not trying to connect you with people for your right now. He's going to connect you with people for your not yet. I'm going to help somebody up in here today. Uh, you see, and so there, there were some relationships that you had, and they were significant in your life. And all of a sudden, it started going left. And you start saying, what did I do? And you start saying, wait a minute, did I do something? Did I offend them? And you start calling. They never called you back. You inbox. They never inbox you back. And you start saying, wait a minute, now something's wrong. What did I do? I, I hear the Lord saying to you tonight, you did nothing. God did it. God frustrated that relationship because the people who you were holding dear in one season did not have the capacity of bandwidth to go where God was taking you. So God had to release them so you wouldn't have a hater you didn't know you had. I'm trying to help somebody right now. Some people can't handle where God's about to take you. Here's the word of God for your life. Here is your hashtag tonight. Stop stalking people God released out of your life I think somebody ought to give God glory for your not yet if you stop whining over who left you might start seeing your not yet I'll tell somebody this shout is for my not yet this is for where God's about to take me this is for the stuff God is about to do in my life God 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 separated wasn't nothing wrong. It wasn't anything really wrong when the space shuttle was flying, when those two rocket boosters fell off. Those rocket boosters were designed to fall off at a certain altitude because they were not designed to fly in the shuttle's orbit. Some people are designed to get you to a certain space but they're not designed to go in your orbit. You're going to crash yourself. You're going to abort your mission holding on to stuff that could potentially threaten where God's trying to take you. If it don't fit, don't force it. Just relax it. God separated them. Wait a minute. And then God set their Boundaries. Boundaries. You stay here. You go here and you stay. You go here and you stay. Here's where the stability comes in. Because when God put them there, he said, you must stay here. And sometimes when you stay there, it may not be convenient. It may not feel right. But you got to stay there and stay in the boundary. Because to violate the boundary is to jeopardize the blessing. Sometimes when you're in that space and it's not happening at your pace, you start looking over the fence and the grass looks greener on the other side of the fence. Come on, let me tell you something. Sometimes it is greener on the other side of the fence because of all that rich manure fertilizer. And some of you got friends knee deep in manure right now. I'm in church. I can't say it like I want to say it. I'll tell somebody you better stay in bounds. Your blessing is in bounds. Your destiny is in bounds. As a matter of fact, some of you, when you leave here, just go in the parking lot. Go through your cell phone. And everybody that's a threat to where God's trying to take you, put by their name, out of bounds. So every time the phone rings, it say, out of bounds, out of bounds. I tell somebody, I'm going to be busy tonight. <laughs> God, God separated them. And then God would leave him. Pastor, God would leave him. The Bible says he would leave. Here it is. Here is the verse, verse 3. In the desert. The desert is an interesting place. The desert is that place where you really, you're not in Egypt, but you're not in the promised land. You're in the hallway. That's where some of you are right now. You're not where you were, but you're not where you're going. And this is where somebody is, you so far out here that going back is not an option. And you so close to what God promised you, you can almost taste it and feel it. Here it is. It's in that space. It's in that space where God would, watch, God would lead him. 
God would lead Jacob, you know, God would lead him. Israel was, Israel was interesting. The Jacob name would come out in the text because, you know, Jacob was that person, you know, who had a very interesting personal biography. You know, Jacob, Jacob it literally became uh, one of the patriarchs, uh, you know, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By default, he really should have been the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. You, but he was a trickster. He stole his brother's birthright. That's a whole nother sermon. <laughs> I'll preach that next time. But listen, but... But, but Jacob, is, you know, has a, has a, he's a trickster, but God, he wrestled with God, and God, he he's really becomes a hiccup in Israel's history. He's a hiccup, even though, and they could not say references to their God without calling his name, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> just like you and I, you ought to be glad you're on the Lord's program. You ain't, people ain't just calling your name because you deserve to have your name called. You know you a hiccup too. <laughs> that's some stuff in your past that's classified. Can I preach this like? But God would use Jacob and take them to this place. And this place, again, it is didactic. It is, it, it is, it is designed to be, uh, it, it is designed to move you from one level. It, he would instruct him. There are things you learn in the desert. You learn nowhere else. There are lessons you get there. You can't get nowhere else. And so he would lead him and he would encircle him. He would instruct him. So you see, your matriculation through the desert works like this. You don't get promoted because of tenure. We promote people because of tenure. Oh, you've been around here a long time. Come on, it's time for you. No, no, no. Now, that ain't what God does. God promotes people because they pass tests. <laughs> you don't go down to your child's classroom. Tell my, my child been in the sixth grade for four years. Y'all need to go and promote him now. No, your child needs to pass a That's what's got some folk on your job about to lose their mind because you hadn't been there longer than them, but you've been promoted over them because they don't know the tests you've been through. When God takes you through these tests, the tests are what qualify you, prepare you for the next level he's trying to take you. And so everything you've gone through, all, all the stuff people have said about you, all the things you've had to endure, all the nights you cried, all the stuff you lost, all the crazy stuff you had to go through, it was all about your tests. And God promotes you because of that. But the word of God for you tonight is the Bible says he kept Jacob as the apple of his eye. There are some things we shout about. I ain't hating on you. You shout about your new house, congratulations. You shout about your new car, congratulations. You shout about your new boo, congratulations. I'm not hating on you, but I believe there are a couple of hundred folk here tonight that can thank God for this one thing. He kept us. You kept my mind, you kept my family, you kept my money, my ministry, my career. I should be outside on skid row. I should be somewhere talking to myself. Touch your neighbor and say, you don't even look like what you've been through. Listen, I got one more announcement, I'm done. I got one more announcement, I'm done. God... God God is about to release you to the next dimension of favor. I need somebody to shout favor is coming to my house. Come on, say it again. Say favor. favor. And release. Uh, I'm going to break it down to you. Uh, you had a lot of reasons to give up. You had a lot of justifiable reasons to walk away from this. In the process, it stretched you. It pushed you. And I know there were moments in which you had literally every reason to give up. But the reason why you didn't give up because something clicked and you realized that God was righteous. God was, God was sovereign. God was, God was great. God was your rock. God was your salvation. And you hung in there and you kept trusting God. And you say, God, this, if this is going to be pedagogical for me, I'm going to go through this, get all the lessons I can. And so now as a result, God says now you're ready now I'm about to release you Israel you have graduated you have earned what I'm about to take you some of you tonight don't realize that you ought to be on the edge of your pew for what God is about to do in your life right now uh, he's about to release you into the next dimension of favor a release is about to happen in Alfred Street tonight watch this I know when you hear the word favor some of us it becomes so cliche that we oftentimes uh, diminish the meaning of favor but let me help you understand what favor really is favor is is that thing that happens when you're uh, driving in the parking lot and uh, everybody else driving around, but you always get the spot. That's all favor. Uh, favor, when you know, favor. When, you know, when you go to the store and stuff ain't on sale, but you get it on sale. That's called, 
favor. When it's time for your baby to go back to school and the money just show up, somebody call that favor. Here it is, somebody who favors when you're in the grocery store and you got, uh, you know, you remember this day when you were in the grocery store and you had $20 in your pocket and a basket full of grocery and you in the line, they were ringing you up and you were nervous and they said, $19.99. Touch your neighbor, tell them that's favor. The favor of God is like this. There is a moment. I'm talking to somebody or not who came on this second night of revival, and here's where you are. You don't realize that you're about to be released, the dream, the thing that God has done in your life. You're about to be released. I told you at the beginning of this message, watch this. There were two things Israel had to know. They had to know who God was and who they were. If you know that, you get through the process. And then the metaphor jumps and screams off the page. As an eagle stirred her nest, who was over her young, takes them up on her wings. This is how God is going to deal with with you. It is said when an eagle builds her nest, she takes thorns and thistles, she goes to the highest tree or the highest cliff, and she builds her nest very meticulously and strategically because she takes the pointed things and she inverts them down, and then she builds the nest as a place of comfort. By putting the pointed things down, she has done that preemptively, assuming that predatory spirits are going to come. And so she's aware that there were snakes beneath the nest that will attempt to rob her of her precious young. But because she has put a defense mechanism under the nest the snakes are detoured you see there's some stuff that's so beneath you God never even told you about he just blocked it I'm trying to help somebody right now when her eaglets are born they are born in a place of comfort and elevation they are born and they now are dependent upon mother eagle and mother eagle must go out and hunt and she brings back meat six times a day they must have meat and they hunger for meat meat meat. She goes out and she brings the meat and she drops it in their mouth. But then there comes a day like today. When Mother Eagle does not drop food in their mouths, Mother Eagle comes back and flies over the nest. This is unusual for the eaglets. They've never seen this before. Mother Eagle comes and she hoovers over the nest. And then she sits in the middle of the nest with no food in their mouths. Mother Eagle now begins to undo what she has done months before. Now the nest that was historically comfortable, now the pointed things have made the nest uncomfortable. And that's what's happening to some of you places where you used to be comfortable are no longer comfortable. And the more you try to make it work, you look crazier and crazier because God is trying to make you uncomfortable. And then what Mother Eagle does next, it looks like child abuse, but it's necessary. Mother Eagle begins to flutter her wings and she pushes her eaglets to the edge of the nest. And remember, the nest is on a tall cliff and on a tall tree and she pushes them and they're in shock. They can't believe mother is doing this to them. But mother eagle knows something. If I don't do this, you're going to die in the nest. And so what I must do now is offer you two choices. Either you fly or you die. I need you to look at somebody tell them I've been through too much to die right now. Tell them I'm going to fly this one out. I came to Alpha Street tonight to tell somebody God is pushing you out of your place of comfort. God is pushing you out of your nest. Your vision is too big for the nest. Your dream is too big for the nest. What God is showing you is too big for the nest. And he's put, reach over and lean on somebody and say, God is pushing you out of that nest. I got to go to my seat, but I need to do a survey. Pastor, if I can do a survey, I need to tell you, you need to look down your road because everybody in Alpha Street tonight is not an eagle. We got to check the road tonight because see, in church, you got several kinds of birds. You got chickens. Then you got turkeys. Then you've got buzzards. And then you got eagles. So I got to help you, Pastor, find out where your real eagles are. Let me tell you who the chickens are. You see, chickens are what's called scary birds. Chicken just keep up a whole lot of noise. But whenever a storm comes, a chicken will run to the chicken coop. And you got a whole lot of people in church. All they do is just cluck, 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 cluck. All they do is gossip, 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 gossip. And when it comes time for prayer, they run to the chicken coop. Look at your neighbor, tell him I ain't no chicken. 
but tell them I'm a bona fide eagle. But then you got to look out because now you got to deal with the turkey. You see, the turkey is a showbird. You see, a turkey likes to come and show you her wings. A turkey likes to gobble, gobble, gobble. A turkey knows exactly what time to come to church. So you can see their new hat, see their new suit. They know exactly what time to come in. A turkey got a see me spirit. But a turkey ain't nothing but a turkey that flocks together. So your neighbor tell him I ain't no turkey but tell him I'm a bona fide eagle but then you gotta deal with that buzzard now a buzzard is a stinky bird because a buzzard like to eat stuff that's dead and buried and you got a whole lot of folk in church all they want to do is go after stuff in your past and they love to feast on what's been dead and buried touch your neighbor tell him I ain't no buzzard but tell him I'm a bona fide eagle. I need to do an eagle check tonight. I'm trying to do an eagle check tonight. Can I tell you how we know you an eagle? We know you an eagle because of, listen, we know an eagle because of her stature. Because every time you see an eagle, an eagle does not flock with other birds. An eagle walks around, an eagle is willing to fly solo. An eagle has her chest out with her head up. You never see an eagle with her head down. Look at your neighbor, tell him, don't confuse my confidence with arrogance. Tell him I'm an eagle. I don't need a whole crowd to affirm me. Tell them I can do this thing so look. But then I can tell you something else about an eagle. It's an eagle's eyesight. An eagle's got vision. An eagle can see 200 yards down the field. Look at your neighbor. Tell them I see you in your future. And tell them you look a whole lot better than you do right now. But there's one more thing, Pastor, and I'm going to my seat. But it's an eagle strength. This is how you know you are real eagle. Because, see, it is said one eagle can go down and get a ewe lamb and bring it back up to her nest. One eagle can bring a goat back up to her nest. Somebody said, how in the world can an eagle bring a heavy goat back up to her nest? How did an eagle get that strong? Let me tell you what happened. One day on the farm, when the storm came, the chickens ran to the chicken coop. The turkeys flocked away together. The buzzards ran under the tree. But the eagle went to the top of the tree, spread out her wings. She began to measure the pressure in the atmosphere. She looked the storm right in the face and started flying toward the storm. And when she flew toward the storm, the pressure in the atmosphere made her wings get stronger because the resistance made her wings get stronger and made her go higher. Look at your neighbor and say, I thank God for the resistance. I thank God for everybody that hated on me. I thank God for everybody that lied on me because all it did was make me go. I believe tonight, when you go on your job tomorrow, just walk in. Where are the eagles tonight? Do me one favor, grab an eagle by the wing. Don't grab a turkey, don't grab a chicken, don't grab a buzzard, but would you grab an eagle by the wing right now? Take them by the hand. Grab another eagle hand by hand. And I need you to hold that hand. And I need you to shake that hand like you're about to shake it off. And tell them you in the process. Tell them everything God's taking you through ain't nothing but process. But tell them when I release your hand, you're getting out of the nest. You go into the next level. On the count of three, one, two, three. Now somebody open up your mouth. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall mount up. Woo! Just tell somebody this is an eagle roll. This is an eagle roll. This is an eagle roll. This is an eagle pew. This is an eagle. Big stuff on this roll. I ain't got time to hang out with chickens. I ain't got time to hang out with turkeys.
pastor of all the birds in some countries people eat buzzard every Thanksgiving we eat turkey and I'm in a black Baptist church I know you eat chicken but nobody eats an eagle tell somebody said that's why I'm still here they tried to take me out they tried to eat but I Letting go of the, your ability to be in control. Releasing everything inside of you <laughs> is your ability to let go and let God to let him have his way in your life. I want you to think about where God is taking you. I want you to get a picture of it. And I want you to think about all the stuff you're doing to try to be in control. Yeah. And let God, let God, let God, let God have his, his way. way. That's when things start happening. I want you to get it in your mind now. When, when I, I stop looking, looking at back then. <laughs> When I let go and, and I, let I let God, what would you do? Oh, I let God have So it's simple, just way. let go. Come on. Let, let God. Come on, Amber Speak. Come on. Let go. Come on, just say it with your lips. Let go. Oh, Come on. Let go. And let God. Let go. Oh, let go. Come on. Let go. Come on. to do real quick I want you to find three people put your arms around them and just tell them let go come on soon as I come on just put your arms around them give them a big old hug and tell them let it go tell them God's got it come on when I let go and I let God let God have his way that's when things start happening when I stopped looking at 